<laughs> well, good morning. You know, today we're going to talk about staying still, and our biggest problem is we like control, and God wants us to choose trust over control, and that's what he tries to teach us through life. So let me read this verse, uh, the, the series verse, Exodus 4, 2 and 3. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. You know, a little warning from God would have been nice. A little heads up, hey, this is what's going to happen when you throw that stick down. And your life and my life are the same way. So often God takes us somewhere, whether we want to go or not sometimes, and doesn't tell us what's next. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to trust him, trust him. You know, years ago, I worked as a maintenance man at a church, and I was in high school, uh, uh, and they had me open the building every Sunday because FPL, if you didn't know that, and this happens here too, FPL likes to charge you extra if you turn on all the air conditioners at one time. We made that mistake last month. I won't even tell you what our bill was here. And so we try to be careful, turn one on at a time. They actually hired me to come in early, turn on one air conditioner, wait. Turn on a second air conditioner and wait. Turn on a third air conditioner and wait. And so that was a great job because after I did that, I could take a nap. But every once in a while, I'd also work with the maintenance guy, and so he was buffing the floors one day, and he said, I want to teach you how to use a buffer. And first, he was just buffing. He'd do one hand like this, and you know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all have seen one of those buffing machines? You seen those? Now, not the kind with the wheels, the kind that just, you know, it's just moving around on the floor. And he said, hey, why don't you try it? And I said, okay. Now, you got to realize that maintenance guys have a terrible sense of humor. They would rather you die if it's funny. So I grabbed that handle, and I squeezed that, and I went across the room, and I was thrown into the wall, which he thought was hilarious, and I probably got a concussion. But anyway, and so he said, well, well come here, come here, let me show you how to work this thing. And he, he uh, I said, no, he said, get it again. I said, so I, so I said, I said, I'm not doing that, and he said, no, no, I'm going to help you. So he put his hand over here on the side, and he said, now squeeze it. I squeeze, and guess what? It didn't move at all. And he said, Eric, the key is about not trying to control the machine. Don't try to think you can force the machine to go here. Let the machine do the work. And if you balanced it just right, you could buff the whole floor with two fingers. That's amazing. Wouldn't recommend it, but it's amazing, right? Here's the thing about our lives. Too often, we want to trust God, but the truth is we get frustrated because things don't move fast enough. God doesn't go the direction we want him to. Something comes into our life that we don't like. We got a doctor that tells us something we don't like. We have a job thing that happens. We have a family thing that happens. And what do we do? We think we can control it. And so we use whatever we have humanly in our flesh to try to control it. Maybe that's anger. Maybe that's frustration. Maybe that's the, uh, the Irish favorite way is passive aggressiveness. Right? I'm Irish. I don't know if you guys knew that. That's talking about me, right? If you're Italian, you're just aggressive, aggressive, right? So whatever works and everybody has their own way. And sometimes we look and we say, well, I know a controlling person, but the truth is we all at times struggle with control over faith. You know what they call this? This is what kids play on their games all the time. You know, this, this is called a controller. A controller. Now, you may look at somebody and go, I know that guy. But, but the truth is, what, why is it called a controller? Because they can move and do anything and everything. Now, they, they sometimes learn the hard way, right? But they learn how to use it. By the way, ours had one button and a stick. It's called Atari. We played Space Invaders or Missile Command all night long, right? And, and now the kids, I mean, they're, they're doing all this stuff. They control everything. So then they get out in the real world, and it doesn't go so well. And we say kids today, but if we're honest, we all struggle with control. And that's what's happening in this verse, in these verses that we're going to read today. Exodus 14, probably the most famous chapter in the Old Testament, the most quoted. My favorite verse in the whole Bible is in Exodus 14. I'll tell you why that is a little bit later. Uh, of course, John 3.16. I love John 3.16 for a different reason. But Exodus 14 is, uh, is the book that so many people turn to. 
Because here's the deal, listen. We think that control brings peace. We think if I can just get this circumstance or this person to do what I want them to do, then I'll have peace. But real peace is about trusting God. So there's a few things that we need to know, and so today we're going to look at how to have a still heart, because the way you know if you are being controlling is your heart, you know, one of the first things to leave is your peace. And so uh, uh, today we're going to talk about this idea of how to foster a still heart. We're going to look at three different things. Number one, recognize fear when complaining. Now, Fear doesn't always cause us to complain, but oftentimes our fear causes us to complain because we don't like something. We don't like what somebody did. We don't like how somebody drove near us. We don't like who, if we're in the passenger seat and we have a bad driver at the wheel, you had that one? You ever ever say, I'm never driving with this person again? Anybody ever had to say that one? I will not talk about my former secretary, Jan Dillingham, who I will never ride in the car with right? You get a great prayer life in those moments. Whole group of us in the car, and I'm like, how are we still alive? Everybody got out of the car, kissed the ground. Thank you, Jesus, for, right? And fear is a natural response sometimes to not being able to control something that painful that's coming, but God can even use that. Listen to where we pick up in Exodus 14, 9 through 12. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped near the sea, near Piharoth and opposite of Baal Zephon. Now, we don't know exactly where this is. There's about three possible locations. And here's what's wild. If you look at the verses before this, they were headed a certain way. They were getting out of Dodge. And God said, about face. And so they went and camped by the sea. Now, If you know anything about military strategy, you want to get off the beach. That's the whole goal. That was what D-Day was about. My mom's cousin died in D-Day. She saw him right before he went to D-Day. The whole goal was use whatever you could, get off the beach. And yet God says, hey, you know where I'm going to take you? To the beach. An impossible situation. And then it continues, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. You ever look up and realize something's coming at you? A problem's coming at you? A trial's coming at you? A struggle's coming at you? And they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. So they're terrified, and first they cry out to God. That's kind of like us. Like the first thing we do is, God, help me. But then that doesn't seem to work as quick as we want. So 10 seconds later, we do what they did. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt you brought us to the desert to die? By the way, this is typical us. Situation comes at us. We don't like it. And what do we do? We think the very worst thing that could ever happen. I'm going to die right here, and it's too marshy to even dig a grave. I would have had a better grave back in Egypt where there's sand. I mean, here we are on the edge of the, of the Red Sea, and we're going to not even be able to dig graves for me. I would have been better off to die in Egypt. But then they continue, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you, I love this, they just make something up at this point. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So they totally make up a story. Moses, we did not want to come with you. Um, so what's all this packing you did and taking of gold artifacts from your neighbors and heading out, right? We, we, we enjoyed being beaten. I mean, it looks so good. And here's the deal. When God begins to move you into a new place, it is very uncomfortable. And if you're not careful, you'll want to go back to the old ways of doing things. You'll think, well, I went the wrong way. Something happened to me. What what did I do wrong? And yet, when we begin to do what God wants, we can even question, you know, it was easier when I wasn't doing that. Anybody who teaches that when you do God's will, things will be easier, you need to realize they're not a good teacher. Because the truth is, over and over, when you do God's will, you will suffer. Isn't that great news? You don't just serve so you can feel good. You serve because that's what God wants you to do. 
And yet so often, what do we do? We step out and do what God wants to do, and it's difficult, and we say, gosh, I'm not doing that anymore. I helped one time, and somebody was mean to me. I'm never helping again. I used to go to a small group, and people weren't nice. Somebody gossiped about me. I'll never go to a small group again. I used to trust church people, and then this happened. I used to go to church, and then this happened. Guess what? Welcome to the cross. Dave Busby used to say that all the time. When something difficult happens, welcome to the cross. That's just life as a Christian. In James 5, 9, it says this, don't grumble against one another. And when you find your grumbling, guess what? That means your heart is stirred up. You don't have a still heart. Quit grumbling against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. And I love this. The judge is standing at the door. It means Jesus is listening. He's paying attention. By the way, the two verses right before this, you know what they talk about? Patience. Because what's the opposite of a, of a wild heart and a frustrated heart? It's patience. You ever caught so many traffic lights that you finally gave up? If you drive to Orlando today down Highway 50, I can tell you at some point, you'll get frustrated a couple lights. I can't believe I caught that light. And after you catch about eight, you go, well, that's just how it is. And guess what happens when you do that? You relax. Some of us are so busy trying to control life and control other people and even holding unforgiveness against other people that we're frustrated and irritated. We may not even realize it, but we're so busy and we're, and we're having heart attacks. People say worrying about something won't change anything. Yeah, well, give you a heart attack. Absolutely, give you gray hair. One of the things that I try to do when we help people to rise up in leadership in our church is to give them a little responsibility and see what happens. Why? Because those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much. So you give them a little responsibility, watch what they do. And I can tell you what happens when you begin to step out and do what God wants you to do. Like, let's say you bring soup to your neighbor. And you say, I'm going to be nice to him. So you bring soup to your neighbor, God bless him. Hey, just don't forget to give me the bowl back. Two years later, you're looking through your cabinet for the bowl and you realize, oh, I brought soup to my neighbor. I will never do that again. That's when you know who you did it for. See, when you serve God and you begin to step up and do what he wants you to do, you're going to have opposition and then you have to choose, what am I going to do when I have opposition? Am I going to listen to God and be still? Or am I going to try to control everything and everyone around me? How dare those people say that or think that about me? By the way, it, in America, when somebody says they're persecuted, I almost laugh. I've been persecuted in America. Really? What? Somebody was mean to you? There was a whole church wiped out by machine guns a few weeks ago. Did you know that? They wrote me a mean letter. I tried to serve in the nursery and a parent yelled at me. I suffered for Jesus. Right? Why? Because we try to control everything and everyone. And God says, if you're going to do my will, you have to trust me. Even when I take you to somewhere you don't like. When the doctor says something you don't like. When that relative doesn't act the way you want them to. When you have a teenager. I'll just leave it right there. That's all you need. So the first challenge today is this. Listen, confess the fear that makes you complain. John Calvin said this, seeing that a pilot steers the ship in which we sail, who will never allow us to perish, even in the midst of shipwrecks, there's no reason why our minds should be overwhelmed with fear and overcome with weariness. When you trust God, guess what? Some of you are tired because you're trying to control life. It may be time to sit at the light and let it go. Say, so God, you know what? I can't control this situation. I can't control this person. I can't fix what happens. But I trust you. Number two, give up your control to God. Boy, that's so easy to say. What is this called? Extension cord, right? Power strip. How well is this going to work if I plug something into it right now? Not very well, right? Because I got to take this and I got to plug it into the source of power, correct? Too many people serving in ministry are trying to give of themselves to other people without taking time to plug into the source. If you're going to serve God, you've got to take time to have a quiet time. You've got to sit on your porch with the Bible and let God power you. 
Otherwise, you'll be working in your flesh. And not only will you have nothing left, the people who, who you're helping to lead or to encourage will wonder why it's so dry. But when you plug into God's power and you get around other people, guess what? He can use you to bless, encourage, and even help other people come to know Him. The verse continues, verse 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. And the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. And then my favorite verse in the Bible, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to get really busy. The Lord will fight for you. You need to only build a bridge. The Lord will fight for you. You need to defend your reputation. The Lord will fight for you. You ready? You need only be still. In the Hebrew, this word means be still, means be quiet. And it's not a very nice word for be quiet. It's that word that my mama won't let me say. Right? And so he says, hey, hey, quit talking and start listening. Quit, quit doing so much and take time to get still. Listen, too many of us are trying to do God's will without plugging into God. And when we do that, we are not an example of Christ to other people. But when you plug into Him, when you take time to pray for others, when you take time to allow His peace to fill you, when you read His Word and you allow His Word to change you, then you're able to walk in power, but only when you're still. In Hebrews 4.14, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. This verse says that he is our high priest. You don't have to come to... Uh, I'm glad for you to come and have me pray for you, but the truth is Jesus is your high priest. So if you want to go to God, you just talk to Jesus. And guess what? When you pray and when I pray, God doesn't say, oh, Eric's on the line, pay attention. When you pray, you have just as much power as I have when you pray. Why? Because it's Jesus who is the high priest, not your pastor. Now, I'm like I said, I'm glad to pray for you. The Bible encourages us as pastors to pray for you, to anoint some of you with oil, all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, Jesus is the high priest. So when's the last time you took your problems to him? and laid, him at, laid those at his feet. Now, let me tell you what I do all the time. I say, God, I'm struggling with this. Uh, let's just say it's a person. God, I'm struggling with this person. It's really bothering me. And God, I'm just going to lay it at your feet. So, Father, thank you so much for taking care of that. And God, you know what? I'm just worried about this person. And I'm just frustrated about it. And I pick it back up and I carry it around all. You ever do that one? I remember Johnny Lord talking about how she prayed for burdens. And she said she would, and sometimes she would do it physically. She would say, God, would you take my burden? And then she would turn her hands over as a representation of, I can't hold on to that anymore. Is there anything you're trying to hold on to that is wearing you out? Confess any area of control and release it to God. See, the Bible says if you're listening to God... Galatians 5.22 says what that's going to look like. So when people say to me, what does God sound like? Well, it always lines up with His Word, and it always lines up with the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Are you, are you being led in love, in joy, in peace, patience? Oh, I don't like that one. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Self-control. Is God leading you in those ways? As you trust Him, that's what He'll do. Number three, God provides as we move forward. Remember, we like control, but God often will take your control away. All of a sudden, your controller's out of batteries. Somebody does something and you're thinking, how do I fix that? And all you can think is, how do I fix that? How do I fix it? Hey, wouldn't it be awesome if our first response to a thing we don't like is to pray Instead of gritting our teeth. By the way, if you feel the tension in your shoulders today, <clears throat> it could be that you're thinking God's not going to provide. You know, the main way that we give control to God is by trusting Him to save us. 
And last night, one of our ladies who I talked to two weeks ago came to me and said, Eric, I just want you to know, I gave my life to Christ this last week, and I'd love to pray with you just to kind of make it final. I know a prayer doesn't save me, but I just want to pray with you, and I'm going to get baptized in April. And, and so, Eric, I just want to know that I've released, and what she's saying is, I've released my control to him. Isn't that awesome? That's good news. You can clap. That's all right. So here's the deal. Listen, as we're seeing more and more people, I think we've got eight or ten people waiting to be baptized. We've got people joining our church. As those things happen, what are people doing? They're saying, God, I want to take the next step with you. What's God's next step in your life? So after they got still, here's what happens next. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Don't you love that? God looks at him like, what are you crying about? And if I was Moses, I'd be like, um, did you not notice, you know, all of Pharaoh's armies and chariots, and those chariots had the little razors on the side? That doesn't sound fun, does it? Right? Did you not notice all that? That's why I'm crying out to you. But listen to what God says. Tell the Israelites, move on. By the way, some of you need to do that. Some of you, what's bothering you today has nothing to do what's hap with what's happening now. You are letting yesterday... You are letting last year, you're letting something that happened years ago keep you from what God wants you to do next. It's time to move on. It's time to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Time out. I just want to throw this out there because you're going to hear it. Some people say, well, they, they wrote that down wrong. It wasn't the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea. And every once in a while, the Reed Sea, the wind blows and it dries it out. So this wasn't a miracle. It was just blah, 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 blah. Well, then the miracle is that when Pharaoh's army came through and the water came and killed all of them, it was amazing how they could die in a puddle. So either way, don't worry about where it is. Just say God does a miracle when he wants to do a miracle and be okay with that. little lamb yap extra for you there. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea, I love this, on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That'd be one kind of wind, wouldn't it, to have water on both sides? Let me ask you this question. Where do you need to move forward? Maybe it's baptism for you. Maybe it's salvation for you. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe it's beginning to say, God, how do you want me to step out? Maybe there's somebody that you know you need to call. Maybe there's somebody you know you need to check on. Begin to pray, God, would you show me what area I need to move on? And by the way, when you move on, that doesn't mean it's easy. Change is hard. We don't like change. We like everything to be the same. You know, I'm really hopeful in the next month or two that we can reduce all this mask mess. But let me tell you an answer. I don't know. I don't know the future yet. Do you? So, so we think that's what we're going to do. That's what we're moving towards. That's where we want to be. But hey, guess what? I'm allowing God to make changes. What do I do? I just take the next step. Okay, God, this is what we're going to do this week. Okay, God, this is what you want me to do. What is it in your life God wants you to do? I love this, 2 Peter 1. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Do you have that? Grace and peace in abundance? Through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, His divine power has given us a couple of things we need. No, everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him. How do we have knowledge of Him? Through His Word. Through the Bible, we spend time in the Bible, we learn about Jesus, our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. He wants to give you everything you need. Here's your final challenge. Ask God to help you move forward in His Spirit. If today as I was talking, you thought of something you're hanging on to, a burden that's bothering you, a place you're at that you don't like, Maybe something in your life that's making you very uncomfortable. Hey, can I tell you what to do? Be still. Be still and know He is God. Be still and let Him fight for you and quit trying to fight for your rights, your control, and yourself. And say, God, you show me what to do. And when God wants you to step up and fight, you step up and fight. 
And when God wants you to move forward and cross the river, you move forward and cross the river. But so often God brings us somewhere where we can't do a thing about anything. So during those times, the Lord will fight for you. You just have to get still. My prayer for you is that you'd get still every day. You'd spend some time in the Bible every day, whether it's using a, a resource like Daily Bread or you just read through the Bible, whatever you want to do. But you spend time every day getting still and allowing God to speak to your heart. Praying for your friends, praying for your neighbors, praying for your family and getting still as you do it. God, here's my child. Here's my friend. Lord, I lift them up. Lord, here's my burden. Lord, here's my hurt. And just give it to him. And as you do that, guess what? The peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We think control brings peace, but it's trust that brings peace. Do you need to trust him today? If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. The Bible says that Jesus came and died for our sins. Why? Because we're all sinners and we need forgiveness. And the only way that could be paid for was through a sacrifice. And Jesus gave everything for us. And the Bible says if you trust him, if you surrender your life to him, knowing that he died on a cross and rose again, that salvation comes to you for eternity. If you need to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what that means. Maybe you're watching online. You can send me a note or an email. I'd also tell you, if you've never been baptized as an act of faith, take that next step. If you never stepped up into ministry, I encourage you to take that next step. If you never joined a small group or a Bible study, take that next step. Don't stay where you are. As you take that step, God will give you peace even on the journey. Let's pray today. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word and your power and your peace. Lord, I know there's somebody here or watching at home today who is stressed out about something they can do nothing about. So, Father, I pray that that peace that passes understanding right now would cover them. Lord, I pray also for that one who needs to take that next step of faith, whether it's salvation or baptism or something else, that, Father, they would step out. Maybe it's forgiveness that they need to give. I pray that they could step out and walk in that by faith. Lord, we trust you today. Thank you for moving our church forward day after day. Father, as folks come this Easter season, I pray you would draw people home, not to us, but to you, that we could be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.